Um, welcome to our interactive um, Bible study. Um, the topic for this afternoon's consideration is spiritual rebirth, confession, repentance, and growth. I'm absolutely delighted to have with us two very, very close friends. I'm just going to allow them just to introduce themselves, starting with the lovely sister here. Hi, I'm Sister Sherry. I'm Sherry Habib, and I am a member of Croydon Seventh-day Adventist Church. My name is Stanley Aina. I'm also from Croydon Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I'm yours truly, I'm Brother Henry. I'm from Croydon SDA Church. Um, as with anything, when we open the Word of God, it is always important for us to open it with prayer. So could you join me as we pray a short prayer as we go into this afternoon's study? Uh, Father in heaven, we want to thank you, dear Father, for the opportunity that we have to open your word. Indeed, your word brings to us life and light. We ask, dear Father, that as we open your word, that our hearts will be enlightened and that we will be transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks much. The aim of this afternoon's study is to recognize the important ways in which genuine repentance and confession relates to spiritual growth and the reception of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in terms of the main text that we have for consideration is John 3, verses 3, all the way to verse 5. I read in your hearing. Um, Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. In verse 4, it continues. The question is asked, how can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asks. Surely they cannot enter a second time in their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of the water and the spirit. As I begin this afternoon's journey uh, through the scripture, I will just share with you a story. This story is about John. John is a very hardworking person who believed in God and spent most of his life in the service of his local church. He managed to go to university and got a degree in accounting. He served the church as their local treasurer for many years and worked as a, at a local company as an accountant. One day, John was arrested for misappropriation of funds at work. He was promptly arrested. He was subsequently tried and convicted. The church moved quickly to relieve him of his position as a treasurer. John was sentenced to three years in prison. John accepted that he had done wrong. While in prison, serving his sentence, John came back, John came to a realization that he needed to change, and he accepted that he had done wrong. He confessed his sins and decided to repent. After serving his sentence, John came back to his local congregation and explained that he needed to be born again. He needed to be baptized. He was baptized. Two weeks later, it was nomination time for church officers. Um, John's name was put forward to head the treasury. The question that I have for our viewers is, should John be given the post now that he has confessed and he said that he has repented? Bearing that in mind, all that I've said before, let me know if you think that John should have gotten the post. One of the members of the nomination committee stated that if we judge John on the basis of something that God has already forgiven him of, then we are judging an innocent person. My viewers, do you think that that member is right? Let me know your thoughts. Throughout scripture, both repentance and confession have prepared the way for spiritual revival. God always prepares his people to do a great work for him 
by leading them to godly sorrow for their sins. Once we acknowledge our sins and confess them, we are on track to have victory over them. For 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 states that the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, Lord, not willing that we should perish, but that all should come um, to repentance. Repentance and confession are two prerequisites needed in order to receive the Holy Spirit power in abundance. So my question, Elder Stanley, what does it mean to be born again? <clears throat> what it means to be born again, if we just revisit John 3, verse 3 to 7, I mean to 6 to 5, that's where Jesus said, very, very, I say unto you, the, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. If I interrupt you, Elder Stanley, what's wrong with the first birth? First birth, we can say the first birth, we are born in Adam's family, in sin, because be, through the inheritance of being a child of Adam, we are born in sin. So if we have to go through that rebirth, we have to be born spiritually in, the, in, my, in, the, in, in my father's family, which is Christ. And that is a spiritual process that we must go through for us to be born again. So as sinners, that will be cleansing. The flesh will go, and the will of the Father will be what will continually do and seek his face. Good. I'm, I quite agree with you, Elder, Elder Stanley, because it seems as if Nicodemus understands the biology of it. But in terms of spiritual matter, it seems as if he, he was not on point. Um, Sister Sherry, mm. could you explain what is meant by spiritual, the spiritual rebirth experience? Now, if I, if I look at this, I, I, the first thing I actually think you need to look at is the spiritual death. Because you can't talk about spiritual rebirth without looking at what is spiritual death. And I would say that when we're looking at the spiritual rebirth, it, the spiritual death, I think it's when we, before we knew God or before we accepted God, we're living in our lives with actions, behaviours or thoughts that go against God. And, and what that's called is, uh, is going astray from God's path. So we don't have any remorse for it. We don't um, want to acknowledge it. We don't want to take accountability for it. We excuse it. Um, we may even love what it is that we're doing. And we don't want to realise that we're living in a way that God doesn't want us to, to live. And when I looked at what transgression means in outside the biblical sphere, it actually means living an impaired or spoiled quality of life. So my thoughts on this would then go to John, 1 John 2, um, 16, and, and I would... If, where it says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So... When we go back into the spiritual realm of it, this going against God is called transgression against God, and that's what the actual sin is. And as humans, we're sort of prone to being, doing sin. We're prone to the wrongdoing that's against God because we're prone to wanting to rebel against him. So then when we look at spiritual rebirth, that's that 180 turn. So I'm very expressive with my hands. Um, so that's that, please, that's, please, feel, <laughs> please feel free. Yeah. Um, but that's that, that, that 180 turn, because then we have our eyes are open, our ears are, we're willing to hear, our minds gain that wisdom because of that 180 turn. And we understand how God viewed us before and how he judged how we thought and what we said and what we did as being sinful. Um, so I, I think then you would go on to, um, I think a verse would be uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, anyone in Christ is a new creation and old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So it's total transformation um, based on what um, Sister Sherry is saying. This gift of, uh, of repentance, I'm, I'm always curious as to where it comes from. Um, Elder Stanley, could you read and explain, or rather summarize, or read or explain, depending on what you want to do, Acts 5, verse 30 to 32. And from that, what important points can we take from, from what Peter said um, here in Acts 5, verse 30 to 32. Elder Stanley, over to you. Acts 5, 30 to 32, said the 
God of our ancestors, raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witness of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. So what we have to look at here is that, first, Peter made one critical point, which is, first, repentance is a gift. As we open our hearts to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, Jesus gives us the gift of repentance. The second one is that the disciples themselves, they were witnesses in their own lives of reality of experience. They not only preach repentance, they experience it. As the disciples waited to, for the fulfillment of promise, they humbled their hearts to true repentance and confess their unbelief. As they called to remembrance the words that Christ had spoken to them before the dead, they understood more fully the meaning and they meditated upon this. So holy life, they felt no toil would be too hard as they go through this process. Repentance and confession are common things throughout Acts as you go through the Bible. If you look at Acts 17 to 30, 31, 26, and 19, you will see all about repentance and confession. It's goodness of God that leads us to repentance. It is the convincing power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot do it by ourselves. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that brings us to the realization of the things we need to do so that we can have that repentant heart. So the Holy Spirit fills us and we empty our selfish ambitions, selfish desire, and all those things that drive us. Thank you, thank you, Elder Stanley. From what you've said, I, I think it's quite clear that repentance is a gift um, that, God, that God gives. Um, and this gift of repentance, the, you know, godly sorrow for sin, uh, the Bible declare work it um, repentance. Um, why is it then, Sister Sherry, why is it so difficult to acknowledge our sins and repent of them? I want you to stick up in there also, and why is it so, so easy to let self get in the way of true repentance? So I go again. Why is it so <laughs> difficult to acknowledge our sins and repent of them? And part number two is, why is it so easy to let self get in the way of true repentance? <laughs> you know, you know if, we, if we're honest with ourselves, and I, th I, I have to go by my own experience, I think, um, especially if I go back before I understood about being with Jesus, I think there's, there's three main ways that we have this difficulty acknowledging sin. I think one of the first ones, and I mentioned it before, and it's about our rebelling against God, because we don't want to measure ourselves against his standard. When you think of ourselves before we knew Christ, we go by our own opinions as to what good is, which means we go with our own opinion as to what bad is. Or if we then think of anybody else, it will be people that we esteem or we think has the same similar opinion as us, that we agree with their opinion as to what good or bad is. And we don't want to put it as God's standard, which is beyond man. Um, so I think there's that rebellious part of it. Um, and I think... Um, even if we do decide to go with what God's standard is, we're still going to have a problem wanting to describe it as a sin, especially if it's things that we like. And I think um, one of the other um, reasons is that even if we want to admit that we've done something wrong, even if we realise we've transgressed against God, so in that sphere as well, I think we don't want to usually take accountability. We're always looking at a way to qualify or excuse it or, or to blame it on someone else. And, and actually, I think that, that's sort of in our DNA. Can I say that? I think it's in our DNA. I think you just did. I think I, think I did. <laughs> you know, I think it's, it's almost like it's a muscle memory of the human race to blame someone else for something that we've done. Um, and we see it with, in, in Genesis, I think it's in 3.12, where Adam, when he got caught out for going against God, and God said, what are you doing? What did he say? It's the woman you give me. Yeah. It's the woman you give me that made me eat of the fruit. So this muscle memory that we've got through the ages, I think, is, is where we can see that we would, call, we would blame others as opposed to taking accountability. And, and in, 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 ter in, in terms of parity, to establish parity, the woman did also blame the serpent. So she blamed it, it's, it's yeah. like, <laughs> so Hitting downwards, hitting yeah. downwards. Okay. And then there's one last thing, I think, is that we, we actually sometimes 
sometimes, and I don't think we often do that because we're, we're trying to be so good, is that we have to admit that we love the sin that we're doing. Okay. So if we enjoy what it is that we're doing, we'll excuse it to say, well, it's not that bad. And, and so there's several verses. I think one of the verses uh, is, is 1 John, I think 1 John 2.16. And, and that, that one in particular was uh, saying... Um, Oh, I've read that one already, didn't I? That the, the pride, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not the father, but of the world. And I like that verse in particular because um, it actually talks about the human condition. So we're obsessed with self-gratification and self-love. Uh, well we're done. obsessed with materialism and money and we're obsessed with self-importance and status. So self in itself. Self um, in itself. Self in itself, self in itself gets, um, gets in the way. Um, we just want to sort of qualify then what... Um, true repentance is. And our viewers, we're asking you the question too, why is it so difficult to acknowledge our sins and to repent of, uh, repent of them? Our viewers, we're asking you, um, send us your thoughts. Why is it so difficult to acknowledge our sins and to repent of them? Um, Elder Stanley, I, I want your thoughts on this one. How does the Apostle Paul describe true repentance? We have spoken about um, false repentance uh, to some degree, and that there are two types of repentance at work. But how does the Apostle Paul um, describe true repentance based on 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 to 11? Could you read and comment on that, Elder Stanley? Okay, uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 9 to 11. So now I rejoice, not that you made sorry, but you sorrow to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this self same thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness you wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourself, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear. Yea, what vehem desire? Yea, what zeal? Yea, what revenge? In all things, you have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. So if you look at this uh, Bible verse, repentance is a God initiative so for sin. It includes a decision to forsake whatever subsequent sin that the Holy Spirit brings to you. So again, I want to read Ezekiel 14, verse 6. He said, therefore, say unto the house of Israel, Thus said the Lord God, repent and turn yourself from your idols and turn away your faces from your abomination. Again, Zechariah 1 verse 4 says, By you, not as your father, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus said the Lord of hosts, turn you now from your evil ways and from your evil doings, but they did not hear, nor hearken unto me, said the Lord. So genuine repentance does not lead Christians into a state of deep, deep depression because of their sinful natures of deed. Godly solo produces repentance leading to salvation. It leads us instead to focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Throughout the New Testament, we saw that the enormity of our sin is never greater than the enormity of his grace because where, the Bible says that where sins abound, right. grace abounds much. So you can see that all these more the law enter the offense might be abound. So if you look at Romans 5 verse 2, all this is well explained. Okay, thanks, um, thanks much. And we see quite a few comments coming in. Uh, Ella Stanley, could you just read the comment that we have from Sister Jennifer Mann? He said, I wonder what private sin we were all guilty of before conversion. We have a responsibility to help restore and love each other to God's kingdom. That love in quotes, can do the opposite intention. Mm. I, think, I think that is well said. You know, well let said. each man examine himself to see if, um, if he is under faith. So Jennifer, thank you very much for the comment that you have sent in. Really appreciate it. Sister Sherry, mm. as we continue along the journey, um, based on 1 Timothy 1, uh, verses 14 to 17, um, could you give us a synopsis in terms of what um, Paul was saying as it relates to his sinfulness and Christ's righteousness? Do you want me to read? Uh, you can summarize. I can summarize it. 
Okay, I think when you go into um, First Timothy, um, First Timothy one fourteen to seventeen, and I think when you when you're looking at that, that there is talking about Paul, um, Paul, Paul, sorry, is talking about the reason Jesus came into the world. He's there explaining when you go through it. He's there explaining. Um, uh, that Jesus came into the world for sinners. And there's a reference in this that it talks about this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And that bit where it's saying faithful saying worthy of acceptance, I think that, that I'm interpreting that to mean, and I, and I, I would help, you know, it'd be helpful for the viewers to, to comment on, on this. But I, I'm looking at that to mean that it's something that believers or or just people, actually, if they're looking at the first time, they can really put their trust in that saying. So that faithful saying, worthy of acceptance, it's a tr- put your trust in it. It's a Bible promise. And it's a gift given by Jesus, since we are all sinners. But none of us are sin-free. The only sinful, sinless being was Jesus. And so this means that everybody has actually got this gift where they can come to uh, this, this acceptance. And, and that's why I'm calling it a gift. I think also um, uh, um, Ephesians uh, 2, 8, 9, by the grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed um, what you have said, Sister Sherry. And as, as it was stated, it is the gift of God. Yeah. And when you have been given a gift, Everybody likes when a gift is appreciated. It's not so. Absolutely. And how you appreciate a gift is that whatever you have been given, you use it and you make full use of what God has actually given you. Mm. Um, to our viewers, um, just ask, there's just a question that I need just to throw out there. Um, just out of a personal question, if you would like to share, we would appreciate your comments. Have you ever felt that you were the chief of sinners? Or if not the chief, still too sinful to be saved. Have you, uh, have you ever learned to rest on the assurance of Christ's righteousness that you are saved? Sometimes we have people um, in church, and even though they have been saved by grace through faith, yet still there are certain points in our lives, I would say, that you feel as if sometimes when you have done things so bad that you don't even, you're not even too sure of yourself in terms of feeling that you're worthy or that you have actually been saved. If that has been your experience, send us a comment. Let us know what your thoughts are. Elder Stanley, I just want to turn our attention now to true repentance. And what spiritual principles do we learn from Leviticus 5, verse 5, and 1 John 1, uh, 1 John 1, verse 9, as it relates to the nature of true repentance and confession? Firstly, Elder Stanley. Okay, let me read it out for, the, for people to understand where, where, where we're coming from. Leviticus 5, verse 5, says, It shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things, that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. Then 1 John 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what we are seeing here is that genuine repentance is always accompanied Mm. by confession of specific sins. The Holy Spirit will always bring to mind exactly those sins that you need to confess and repent from them. He confessed us of our shortcomings and areas that we have to examine in our lives. So we look at true confession, always of a specific character, and acknowledge this particular sin. They may be of such a that God have to bring to our mind so that we have to confess that. It may be wrong that we've done to family members or characters that we need to confess publicly or to the person so that we can move away that. So the purpose of convincing power of the Holy Spirit is to reveal our need to a saving Christ who can save us from this. The repentance does not make that God loves us more than he enables us to appreciate his love more. Confession does not end God's forgiveness, but instead enables us to receive 
his forgiveness. God does not love us more because we are repenting, but does not love us even less because we fear. His love is always constant, but it is for us to confess our sins so that we can be free and stay focused and grow spiritually. I'm, I'm interested by uh, the, the bit that you spoke about as it relates to 1 John 1 and verse 9, um, by how it opens by saying, if we confess. There's a condition say. there. So, so it, it seems to suggest that there is, 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 a, is a condition um, that, is, that is attached to it. Um, what then, what then does sin do in the life of an individual uh, if, if they sort of refuse, um, and, and no problem throwing you at, in, at the deep end, no, no, if, no, they, no. if they refuse to actually confess? It, does, you know, it makes our spirit weak. Yeah. It, it clogs out the way that we connect to God because once you confess your sin, you are free from that burden. You can connect to God. You can do all things by that, having that spiritual flow. Mm. Because once you have that sin all around you, it's kind of a burden. It, it hurts. So you free yourself and that brings repentance. And that confession also increases your love for human being and God. And that's what God has asked us to do. Love one another. When you have that baggage, it's just for you to continue to struggle with it. So there is need for us to have that genuine confession. There is need for us to repent from that sin. So both of them goes hand in hand. Yeah, um, thanks much, Elder Stanley. It says, however much we long for forgiveness, when we confess and repent, we must remember that it's a two-way street. That is, how do we respond to those who have treated us wrongly and who ask for forgiveness, whom, though totally undeserving of our forgiveness, do we need to forgive any, anyway? And why is it important for us to actually forgive them? Our viewers, if we're asking God for forgiveness, is it fair that we should forgive those who have harmed us, even those who have harmed us to the extreme? Let me know your thoughts. As we move on, true and false repentance contrasted. There are some specific examples in the Bible of people who sought repentance, but were not forgiven by God. Many people do not know that there are certain times when people would confess, but yet still are not forgiven by God, even though God is, uh, you know, is abundant in mercies. Um, they were not forgiven by God. The fact is that they wept and they were sorrowful. They confessed their sins, but they were not uh, forgiven. Um, could you share with us, um, Sister Sherry, some examples of some people, um, specifically we want to focus on Pharaoh, mm. Balaam, Esau, and Judas, whichever one you want to take. And we want to try and identify why do you think that they were not forgiven, even though they cried, even though they sought forgiveness, and what is the common thread that linked those four individuals, as it were, in recognizing that this was not genuine repentance, but rather false repentance? Um, I, think, I, I think I'm going to go with um, Exodus uh, if I go to Exodus 12, and that's verses 29 to 32. So I'll read this out first. It's in the um, New King James Version I have. It says, And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all of the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, and there was not a house there that was not that, and there was not a house where there was not one dead. And then he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel. Go and serve the Lord as you have said. <clears throat> also take your flocks and your herds as you have said and be gone and bless me also. And I think the, what strikes me here is, yes, there was all this sorrow. There was this sorrow um, 
you know, all the firstborns were killed. Of course, we can see that it included Pharaoh's household as well. No one escaped this, this last, this, this plague. And yes, in verse 30, it's saying about this, this great crime Egypt. But I'm looking at the cause, the cause for the sorrow and the weeping. And from what I'm looking at here, they weren't crying because of the transgression from their sin. Pharaoh was, wasn't crying and sorrowful because of all the, the, the hard-heartedness he'd had from Not before true. and the people that were supporting him with that hard-heartedness mm. against the people of Israel and against God, Yahweh. Yeah. So he's crying and their crying was, a consequent, was based <clears throat> on the death of the children, on the death of the household, the firstborns. It was based on that consequence of the sin and not of the sin itself. So it wasn't really a genuine repentance. So yes, he said, go, you guys can go, you guys can, you guys can leave. But then when we look at verse 32, what did he say here? Oh, and bless me also. And so then that shows you, again, it's not a genuine repentance. You're not truly sorry for something and still trying to get yeah. a benefit or something in, in, in return. Okay, point, point noted. I'm coming back to you, Sister Sherry. Um, Elder Stanley, could you pick one of the four and elaborate? Um, Sister Sherry has spoken about um, Pharaoh, but before we do that, I think we have on the line um, Elder Muambi. Uh, can you tell us what he's saying? He said, human beings were born in sin and shaped in iniquity, Psalm 55, verse 5. Therefore, it is the natural nature of a man to know what is sin and respond to it negatively. So he said, we gravitate towards sin. Then... Sister Abigail has something. No, he said... Yeah, she's not saying amen, amen Elder. Amen. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think it's one of your biggest fans. Sister <laughs> Jennifer Mann yeah. said... I most certainly have felt the way and asked God to restore to me mm. the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit, Psalm 51. I'm in constant need of God's grace. And all of us are in constant mm. need of, God, of God's grace because the work is not easy, but through God's grace, we will make it. And I'm going to say, regardless of, of the assurance given by the word of God of the forgiveness of our sin, the inadequacy of human nature doubt that assurance. That doubt drives us to go back to God for assurance. So mm. that's the only assurance we have because if we have to stay connected to God, that's the only way we can make it. We can't do it by our own selves. We haven't got the power. We have to do it to the grace of God, staying connected. Okay. Amen. And thank you very much. Much said. And I'm coming back to you, Elder Stanley. Um, we were looking at false repentance and we were saying that even though we have quite a number of examples of people in the Bible who have actually repented, um, what we call false repentance, with many tears and sorrow and yet still they were not forgiven uh, by God. And we are trying to find out the common thread that runs through that. Uh, I have proposed um, roughly four people. Sister Sherry has spoken about Pharaoh, and I have on the table Balaam, Esau, and our favorite friend, Judas. Um, <laughs> our viewers out there, let us know what your thoughts too are as to why these people, even though they cried, weren't forgiven. Elder Stanley, choose one and talk to us about that. Okay, let me read out Hebrews 12, verse 7. It says, For you know how that afterward, and when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So, on the phrase in Hebrews 12, it sums it up. Speaking of Esau, the passage that he wanted to inherit the blessing, so what we look at here is kind of false uh, repentance. His motive is to get what he believes is his bad right rather than genuine repentance. So this is not genuine repentance. It's about false repentance. All he wanted is to get back his bad right. He, so he stick if, a pin because Andy is saying that forgive and you shall be forgiven. After forgiveness, we should never be the same. So if, if, he, if, if as you say, Esau wants repentance, then he, he should never be the same. Elder, well, continue. Well, that was a fake repentance because there is something attached to it. When you have to, when you want to repent, you would repent and let go. You can't repent and still gravitate towards that that you have left behind. Mm. So genuine repentance means that you have to Move away from there completely, as my sister said. Do 180 degrees, move away completely. Yeah. And that's what we expect as Christians. And that's, we can only do that 
with the conviction of the Holy Spirit to the grace of God. We cannot do that alone. So there is need for us to differentiate from genuine repentance and false repentance. Um, quite true. Um, Sister Sherry, is there any one of the four that we have spoken about that you want just to, in a nutshell, um, um, tell us about as it relates to false repentance? I think uh, Numbers 22, 32, 35, and um, when you're looking at... Uh, uh, 30 to 35, it says, And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey three, these three times? Behold, I've come out to stand against you because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely I would have killed you by now and let her live. And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. Um, and then and the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men, but only speak um, the word that I speak to you, and that's what you shall speak. So he went with the, the prince of Balak. Now, the whole story is about... Basically, Balaam was a, a prophet, a sorcerer, and the issue that God had with Balaam was he, he, he was in that realm of prophet. He did have this knowledge of God. God did used to speak to him. He did know who God was. But he used that to, pay, to, to have curses or blessings that he could put on people um, for money. And when you look at um, this bit here, God is not pleased with Balaam because he's this greedy person who uses his knowledge of God for his own gain. And what is the, the message we get from Balaam is that he's not repentant because of his greediness and because of him using God in that way. He's repentant because he didn't know that the angel was stood there. So it's not a genuine repentance at all, again. So and and in, in, in terms of context, um, it, 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 do you think that in our personal lives, sometimes we have people um, around us and even us ourselves, um, sometimes we repent, but it's not really um, um, genuine. Absolutely. And, 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 and what might be the cause of that? Pride. Uh, I would say pride. Pride um, is one? Yeah. Pride, but just to take it back, uh, uh, Henry, I think... First one, sorrow, sorrow have to come in. Sorrow that our sin is broken in our hearts. Mm. That will be the first step. The second step will be an honest confession of those specific sins yeah. that we have committed. Then the third one will be true repentance. It, it includes decision to turn away Wait. completely yeah. from that sin. So it's just so for us to follow those three processes. Yeah. And that's the only way. And through the grace of God, we cannot do it. I keep saying without, so because... Our sinful nature will always mm. want to remind us mm. something that will want to take us back there. So we need to follow this process and prayerfully come out of it because it's not easy to come out of it completely. Yeah. It's only through the grace of God. Okay, um, point, um, point noted. And I think it was Elder Mwambe was saying something, and a few here. Um, Elder Mwambe was saying that repentance is not a, a human emotion but the conviction by the Holy Spirit of our pathetic and hopeless nature. The need for repentance is the inworking of the Holy Spirit. It is the, the grace, grace of, of God. God. And, and Brother Simpson is saying, can repentance be genuine at time? It's gone now. <laughs> <laughs> can repentance be genuine at the time you repent, even if you fall in the same sin um, later? Yeah. Um, Yes. Is it, is, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it, it could be genuine at yeah. the time. That's why staying connected to the source of light yeah. is important. Because, we, you know, we are born in, in sin. So we still keep gravitating towards sin. So staying connected with God is quite important for us to, you know, navigate out of sin completely and repent from those things. So without being connected, there is possibility of going back well, to going, that. Going back, in, going back into that sin. And Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me uh, from the body of this death? He, every time he sought to do good, he evil God presented himself. himself. Until he finally came and said, I have fought a good fight. When he had the victory, I have kept the faith. So it's about how we finish um, the race. It says that true repentance is always characterized by at least three things. First, a sorrow that our sins have broken God's heart. And second, there is an honest confession 
of that specific sin that we have committed. Mm. And thirdly, true repentance always includes a decision to turn away um, from our sins. So when we contrast um, true repentance and false repentance, we see that um, true, repentance, for, uh, true repentance gives you a feeling of sadness because of the, we have sinned against God. Whereas false repentance gives a feeling of sadness uh, because um, of the consequence of sin. True repentance is sincerely confessing our sins before God. And false repentance is vague confession of sin. Um, true repentance gives no excuse and takes the blame for sin. Whereas false repentance looks for excuses and, other, and, and blames other people um, for the sins that we have committed. True repentance drives us to decide to turn away from sin, while false repentance will lead us to continually repeat those sins, and we are only fearful of the, of the consequences. Uh, as, as Andy, uh, Brother Colin is out there. If I go back to Brother Colin, I think Brother Colin has a point there. I, Elder Stanley, could you read it from where you're seated? So who had in Pharaoh's heart? Exodus 7, verse 3. God tells Moses, I who had in Pharaoh's heart. Exodus 7, verse 13. Pharaoh's heart became hard. Exodus 8, verse 32. Pharaoh's heart had, Pharaoh had in his heart. We, we know that um, based on the, what the scripture has said is that Pharaoh has made a decision. And it is God who will move upon the heart of his people to revert whatever, but God do not work unless you have totally committed yourself against it. God doesn't force confession or repentance upon anybody. So false repentance, yes, it might seem as if we have turned away, but genuine repentance would lead to a changing of heart. But God will not force his decision on, every, on anybody. So Pharaoh, I believe, harms his own heart. Yeah? Um, Brother Muambe says, Repentance is not an end of itself, but a means to an end. It is a mechanism through which we can be forgiven. It is an, un, it is an ongoing as long as we are still alive. So repentance is a continual uh, a process. We, so we want to go on with the study to look at confession um, healing power. And this one, confession is, the, is healing in many ways. It opens our heart to receive God's grace. Through confession, we accept the forgiveness that God freely offers at the cross. Confession is healing because it allows us to receive grace. Mm. Confession also breaks down barrier between us and other people. It heals relationship. Based on Psalm 31, so, beg your pardon, based on Psalm 32, verse 1 to 8, in summary, Elder Stanley, what does that teach us about confession and repentance? That Psalm 32 and verse 1 to 8, in summary, what does that teach us about repentance? Can, can I read that, please? Psalm 32, 1 to 8, is it blessed? Sorry, let me. While Elder Stanley is coming with that, Sister Sherry, mm -hmm. are there times we may have confessed our sins and we still feel guilty? Why is that? Um, mm, I think I think that is. Um, I think that that's because we sometimes measure God's forgiveness by our own standards and not his. So when we're, when we're looking at what we've done wrong, we've, we've, put, we've put stratas onto what the level of sin is. So we think lying may not be as bad as murder okay. and so on and so forth. And then, but when we have feel that we've done something really, really bad, we're going to judge it on the forgiveness that we would give to somebody yeah. and that that's where we probably fall down and still have that measure of, of guilt but there are other avenues such as 
uh, evil influences as well. But I think for, for the one that I'm mentioning, I think we should remember that there's promises that God um, has in his word. So, for example, if we go to Psalm 103, 12, that talks about as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So when we remember promises like that, it helps us to understand that when we ask for forgiveness from our heart, the Lord hears that and has answered that, and it is gone. So no, we don't need to pick it up again and carry on with that guilt. Point taken. And before we go back to Edla Stanley, um, Colin has said the unpardonable sin is the result of humans hardening their hearts and to the consequently um, rejecting God's mercy. Mm. So uh, point again um, mm. taken. Elder Stanley. Uh, thanks for that. I think we, I have to look at uh, the, the last verse of that uh, verse. He said, be glad in the Lord. So there is happiness. When if, you, if, you, if you just remind us of what the text was. Okay. It's, um, it's taken from Psalm 31, verse 1 to 8. Psalm 32, 1 to 32, 8. 32, 1 to 8, sorry. Mm. So... Confession breaks down barriers, you've said. It takes away that burden from you. Mm. You know, sometimes when you don't confess your sins or things you've done to the next person, you keep malice. You mm. avoid people. Mm. So that is one burden taken out of your way. It heals, it allows you to have the grace of God. It heals that wound. The other one is true confession. We accept that forgiveness that Christ freely offered to us. Most importantly, as he healed that relationship between you and man, he also healed your relationship with your, our maker because you freely can go and pray to God knowing that you have no burden around you. So through confession, there's a law of healing there. It comes with blessing. So it's good for us to go through this process at all times. Um, point taken. You know, I, I'm reading here that the Holy Spirit may point out something that exists between us and other individuals. And if we have hurt other individuals, it is also important for us to um, heal relationship as we seek a closer um, walk with God. That is that you who have been forgiven must also be willing um, to forgive mm -hmm. others. Um, personal question um, to our viewers. How has guilt impacted your relationship with the Lord and with others? What can you do to help to alleviate the burden of guilt that you carry? Even if you have done wrong and the guilt is a sense, in a sense can be justified, what promises in the Bible can you claim from God to move on? So I want our viewers just to um, reflect on that. As, as Andy is saying that through, through repentance will lead us to be, behold Christ and we will never be the same. It's not so. When we see yeah. how good God has been to us, then we will recognize that we can be equally as good and as forgiving um, to others. So, Elder Stanley, is confession of sin acceptable before God without repentance? In a nutshell. It, it, it takes a deep breath, yeah. and then it's, it's coming up it's for air. It's <laughs> confession. You're confessing. Yeah. yeah, so it's confession of sin. Mm -hmm. uh, acceptable before God without genuine repentance. No. The short answer is not. Please elaborate. Because genuine confession, you have to confess your sin. Mm. You have to move away, as I've said before, from those sin, and ask God to help you navigate around completely from there, and look at the cross of Calvary, where we get help. Look up the Holy Spirit that will help us all through that. Okay, point taken. Sister Sherry, you sound like a lady who is, has a lot of life experiences. <laughs> Can you share with us um, an experience, a very short experience, I might add, yes. of how confession of sin has been a blessing um, to you and help in terms of healing relationship, not only with God, but with other people around you, in a nutshell. Mm. Okay. Uh, we're live on, we're live streaming. <laughs> we are. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I'm actually, I'm saying that, I'm saying it quite frivolously, but I'm actually looking at what I could actually give as an experience, because, you know, we all, you know, you have your day jobs. I think 
Tell me the question again. Uh, Don't do the question again. Okay, I, I'm I'll, gonna I'll, think I'll go again. It, from your own experience, and you can be as general as you choose to be. No, I would How be has specific, confession but... of sin been a blessing to you? And in what way has it helped to heal your relationship with God and with others? You know, you know what I what I could use. Um, you know when, and I don't know if the, the viewers have this, you know, because we all go through stuff and, and we're going through COVID-19 and we're at work or we're furloughed or pre-COVID-19, you might be having issues at work. And I was one of those people having issues at work. And I think um, what the circumstances helped me to, to do was to actually look at the fact that I only call on the Lord when I'm in real big trouble. If I can't fix it in my own strength, I don't think there's any reason to bother the Lord about it. And when you're trying to say to people, you know, you're trying to say, oh, I'm a Christian, you can't have that kind of attitude that you only engage with him mm. when there's a real big problem mm. that no one else can fix. Yeah. Um, because that's transgressing from the, 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 the Lord in the sense that you're not admitting to him that he he can master everything and he is the center of your life and I had to look also at my way of of um, thinking about how people were treating me and the thoughts that I had there so this is confession for true so the thoughts that I had there still being in the church, being a baptised member of the church and having thoughts that, you know what, if something was to drop on somebody in my workplace, I would not be upset. I would not even pretend to be upset. I had to look at those kind of thoughts that I was having and say, I know that's not really of you, Lord. But then I had to admit to myself, I don't even want the Lord to stop me from having those thoughts. I enjoyed thinking about the way, different ways those people could come to harm because of the harm they did to me. So we're talking about true confession I, I'm, and I'm being talking specific. About, yeah, but, yeah, but, because uh, but, it doesn't uh, sound uh, nice, no, it but it's the it, truth. It, 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 probably, it, it's about being honest. Yeah? Yes. And, um, and sharing the information as best as you possibly can. Yeah. But round it off with a cherry on top. <laughs> <laughs> what you, but what, it, what I'm going to say is that the, because I understood who God is, I could go to the Lord and tell him, I don't even really want you to remove this from me because I enjoy thinking these wicked thoughts about these people. And, the, and that would be the difference from being someone in the world who didn't think there was any problem with having vengeful thoughts. I know that, ven lo that vengeance is the Lord's. So when I said to the Lord, I don't even want you to even take these away, he looked at that and said, well, that's the truth of your heart, Sherry. So I'm going to help to make your stony heart flesh and I'm going to help remove that from you. And when I talk to the Lord every day, you know, it changed from the cursing what they were doing and wanting things to happen to them. My prayers changed from Psalm 35 to asking the Lord to help my prayers to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. And my change was that I started praying for my work colleagues, whether good, bad or indifferent, for the Lord to change all of our hearts and to cover the workplace with the Holy Spirit. So knowing who God was, my confessions when I had them were honest ones, mm as opposed to saying what I think would sound good yeah. and, and then and, change And, and, and I take way. on board what you've said, that at least you've opened up yourself so that the Lord can see what you are thinking. Mm -hmm. And in seeing what you're thinking, he could see the honesty of your heart. And of such, he can then work with you or through you um, to make the change that was um, necessary. In one minute, Elder Stanley, can you <laughs> cite an example of how um, true confession has healed your relationship with God and with your with it, those around you? Genuine confession, you know, it helps you to, to you know, stay focused on God because as I said earlier, it takes away that burden of things you've done in the past that you know you should have done. So once you have come to that time that you need to let go and stay focused on God, it helps you to grow spiritually, it helps your prayer life, and it helps you to understand yourself better because when you carry that baggage, yeah. it takes you nowhere. So it has helped me in my journey. 
it's, I'm still a work in progress, but God has taken me from where I used to be to another high because of genuine repentance. Because of genuine repentance. And point taken, um, Brother Simpson said, we ask God to forgive us, but we can't forgive ourselves. So we carry the guilt around. Does that mean we don't trust God to clear the slate? Mm. Is, is that underestimating God's power after we ask forgiveness, but yet still we take up the burden and carry it home? Uh, it, one minute. It's a very difficult one, but sometimes that's the situation most people find themselves. Mm. But again, we have to ask the Holy Spirit to help us clear that cloud mm. that we have around our head that we are still feeling that guilt because he died on the cross of Calvary to take away those pain and those penalties. So, so he died for our sins. Okay, Elder Muambe said, God has called us to come the way we are, but, we will ex but he will expect us not to remain the same. That is, we will want, he will want us to repent of our sin and to, to, stay, to start the way of a new life. The newness of life is true repentance. as is repentance. And, and Pastor Andrew has said in looking forward that repentance is a gift mm. along with genuine spirit that leads to confession and opens the door of mercy and make, uh, makes available God's atoning sacrifice, the blood of Jesus Christ applied to the door lintels of oh, our heart. Yeah. What a man can use words. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, it's just taking us back all the way back to Egypt <laughs> and, 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 and back to Croydon. <laughs> okay, so we, we have looked at um, genuine repentance and, and why it is important for us not only to confess but also um, to repent. Um, there are some people who will probably be looking on this afternoon and might be saying that when we speak about repentance, we tend to speak about it from a theoretical um, perspective. But we just want to share probably a few um, written testimony of people who have, ac who have actually experienced uh, the new birth experience. Um, Elder Stanley, could you summarize Sister Blossom's um, testimony in two minutes? Okay, I'll, be, I'll try. It's our choose that both. To, no, living my previous life and now working with God by no means has been an easy road. In fact, it has been challenging to the point that where God intercedes to help me with my prayer life, this has improved immensely. Additionally, being blessed with a prayer partner helps me to develop the understanding, the power of prayer, and the need to fast and pray, and ultimately having the presence of God in my life daily. From this, I have peace of mind, even in the midst of storms. This is because God has taught me to study the word of the word and believe it even when I struggle to fulfill it. I'm so thankful that he never gives up on me. The consequence of this is God teaching highlights many examples of how we ought to live with each other and the humble servant to those who are in need. So generally what she's saying in essence is that God has been faithful in so many ways. He has commanded her to turn away from her sin completely. And he is, she's very grateful what God has done. He said, my faith and belief continue to be strengthened because Jesus makes a difference in my life. Amen. So that is a practical a person in the 21st century talking about God's ability to forgive and the importance of repentance, confession, and growing up in Christ. S Sister... Um, Sherry, you have another written testimony there. Yeah, this is from um, Sister Matimba, and um, she actually uses um, her Bible text. She says is um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Um, and that, chap that verse says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So she's saying about the fact that she accepted Christ as her personal saviour and she wasn't the same when he touched her soul. She felt something had happened and she knew he had touched her, made her whole. And she's saying that the joy floods her soul. She's saying that Jesus Christ is with me all day long. I want to live in Christ and for Christ alone. My heart is full of joy, love, happiness, serenity, trust, faith, and peace of mind. In this Christian journey, every day I accept Christ as my personal saviour, my Lord, my teacher, and my healer. No matter what may be the tests and challenges I face in daily basis, on a daily basis, Christ is taking care of me. 
Jesus Christ is my redeemer because he lives I can face tomorrow. I am the winner through Christ my Lord. I will never cease to praise him. I will shout it while eternity rolls. Thank you, Jesus, my Lord and personal saviour. And amen, amen. And I just, I, I really like this because the 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 joy and the celebration of it just jumps yeah, from the page. From it, it springs it? Yeah. from what she's, she's written and she's quoted. And you, you get the sense that, yes, whatever comes what may, she's standing up for God. And I hope I get to that stage, Sister Matimba, yeah. and I'll be able to give similar testimony. Now, there are quite a number of testimonies. Uh, uh, Sister Marcia Lewis has also sent in a wonderful video testimony. And at some point or another, um, given the opportunity, I I would love to play that Sister Althea Stone, as Sister Althea Sinclair has also sent in another lovely um, uh, voice note, testimony, speaking about um, God's goodness. And also we have Sister Andrea Stone also mm. sent in a lovely video testimony. Mm. So we see the importance of people sharing their experience of the spiritual rebirth, of the mm. importance of um, confession, of repentance, and of growing up in Christ. And I know that this has been the experience of many of us in terms of coming to Christ and walking with Christ. But we must be able to separate false repentance from genuine repentance, and we must be able to know the importance of growth as we walk with Christ. If it's a matter of spiritual growth, is also what is what in the spiritual term, what is important in the spiritual term is also important in the physical world. Because if we're not growing, we're dying. Yes. And if we're not feeding, the man that we feed the most grows the strongest. So as we seek um, to come to a close, as the counter has turned red, uh, <laughs> which, which indicates that um, our time together is nearing a, a close. Um, your final thoughts. Um, what advice would you leave with our viewers regarding ways that we can embrace the spiritual rebirth experience and grow spiritually? Elder. Okay, my, my uh, advice will be for us to you know, try to repent. Repentance and confessions are key elements of spiritual growth. Unless we acknowledge our sins and confess them, Holy Spirit power in us will be limited. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. When we yield to the prompting of the Spirit and prepare our hearts to receive him, he will come into our lives and in all fullness and we will see the manifestation of God and in so many ways. Sister Sherry, um, your I've, final I've, thoughts. I've got, to, this is to uh, encourage our, our viewers. I, you know, I gave my, my, my confession, my testimony, um, specifically so that we can see that we're not in this by ourselves. We're in this together. So for, for all of us who are walking with the Lord and... I know it's hard. I know that um, it's hard to stop sinning. It's hard to, to encourage yourself to do that. I would say go to 1 Peter 5, 9, which says, resist him and be firm in the faith because you know that your brethren throughout the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And also in Proverbs 10, 25, when the storm has swept by, the wicked are gone, but the righteous stand firm to ever. Forever. Okay. So we stand on the promises and on the, on the word of God. As we have said that it is God's wish that we should all repent Amen. and be saved. Um, in answer to Elder Muambe's question, it is God's wish that we should all repent and be saved. Heaven has enough room for every Amen. sinner <laughs> who wants to genuinely repent mm. and to make Christ their Lord and Savior. There is enough room for you and there is enough room for me. As a matter of fact, I'm hearing that the land that they have over there is, is, is not highly populated and that there are still room <laughs> in God's kingdom and the door of the kingdom still stands ajar. Yeah. So my friends and my viewers, won't you join with us in terms of genuine repentance, surrendering your life mm. to Christ and allow Christ to do for you what Boris Johnson and all the leaders of the world yes. cannot do to change you from inside out. Mm. It is no, in my closing thoughts are, it is no small thing to be a Christian and to be owned and approved of God. 
The Lord has shown me, says the writer here, some who profess the present truth whose life does not um, correspond with their profession. They have the standard of piety, although too low, and they are far short of Bible holiness. Mm. Some engage in vain and unbecoming conversation, and others give way to the rising of self. We must not expect to please ourselves, live and act like the world, have its pleasure, and enjoy the company of those who are of the world and reign with Christ in glory. In the upper room, the disciples repented and confessed their sins to God, and if necessary, to one another. They were reconciled with God and in harmony and in one accord. They prepared their hearts to receive the mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Sin hinders that same mighty outpouring of the Spirit in our hearts. It blocks the flow of God's Spirit. Repentance and confession of specific sin of our, is our way of opening and unclogging the channels of the soul so that the richness of the Spirit of God can reside within our hearts and to change us from the inside out. Mm. Lovely crafted word. The Holy Spirit is here waiting to transform you and I and to make us into better individuals, suited and booted um, for the kingdom of God. So thank you again, um, Sister Sherry, um, for your company. Thank you. Um, and Elder Stanley, thank you for your regular faithfulness, <laughs> as, as we would say. But would you join me in prayer as we close this session, as we have looked at the importance of confession, of repentance, and of actually growing in Christ. Father in heaven, we want to give you thanks for the time that we have spent going through your words, looking at spiritual rebirth, the importance of confession, the importance of repentance, and the importance of growing in Christ. Just to be reassured that our re repentance is not a false repentance, but it is a genuine repentance with a desire by the moving of the Holy Spirit to live a life that is totally surrendered to God. We ask, dear Father, that you will be with us, continue to walk with us, be with our viewers, dear Father, those who have not met you yet, who do not know the, 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 the richness that salvation brings and the joy that comes from God. We thank you, dear Father, for the testimonies of the individuals who have stated how you have changed their life from the inside out and planted their feet, so to speak, on higher ground. Father, continue to lead us, continue to direct us. Even in trials, you are by our side, and you will never leave us, the Bible declare, or forsake us. Amen. So until then, dear Father, keep us sweet, keep us faithful, but more so, dear Father, transform us. Allow us, dear Father, to confess, to repent, and to walk humbly with God. Hear and bless us, guide God and protect us. We ask in no other name but the name of Jesus, who saves, who keeps, and who still satisfies in the 21st century. Amen. 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 So until then, thanks again for spending time with us as, as a family, I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> we, we just had a meal looking at God's word. Mm -hmm. And my hope and my wish is that next week you will join us so that again we can explore the richness and the fullness of God's word mm -hmm. and that we can draw sustenance out in terms of what God wants to communicate to us as we share together as a family. So again, until next time, Stay well and stay with God. Amen. Mm.